here's Asia at the, at the continental scale, um, Google Earth image. Asia is Earth's largest continent. It covers about a third of its land surface area, and it can be described to a first order as the fragmentary nucleation around the Siberian Craton, fragmentary nucleation of continental crust to the southwest over the last one billion years or so, which is about 22% of, of Earth's history. Um, it's divided into the, the northern orogenic zone and the southern orogenic zone, or the Central Asian and Alpine Himalayan orogenic belts. And interestingly, they actually cover about the same surface area, they're just totally different shapes. The Central Asian orogenic belt is this like, triangular wedge shape, whereas Alpine Himalayan orogenic belt is really long and narrow and extends in, into Europe. And uh, they're separated from each other by these uh, comparatively small uh, cratonic land masses, namely the Karakum, Tarim, and North and South China cratons. And of course, modern uh, continental collision is driven by the northward movement of India and Arabia with respect to uh, stable Central Asia. So with regards to the Central Asian orogenic belt, it's amalgamated uh, since the Neo-Proterozoic to the end of the Permian, so it's about 16% of Earth's history, and to first order it involves the assembly and breakup of the Rodinia supercontinent, the opening and closure of the Paleo-Asian Ocean, and the assembly of Pangaea at the end. The Alpine Himalayan orogenic belt to the south uh, is characterized by a Triassic to recent amalgamation beginning at around 220 MA, um, and this uh, orogenic belt comprises uh, less of, was amalgamated over less of Earth's history, about 5%. And involved the closure of the Paleotepes, Mesotepes, and Neotepes ocean basins. And of course, this is where we find Earth's thickest crust and highest mountains, and so on and so forth. So, this is where I'm going to drive to in the next uh, image. And yeah, like Paul said, my PhD research was based in uh, Tajikistan. And this is a country where both the Tian Shan and the Pamir orogenic belts are exposed in a single unified state. So, it provides easy access to, uh, to both origins. Both episodes of Earth's history. And uh, now I'll mention my uh, projects. Uh, so the first one is an investigation of the western South Tian Shan, part of the Central Asian Orogenic Belt. It involved uh, late Paleozoic closure of the Paleo-Asian Ocean, collision between two uh, continental terrains, the Karakum Terrain in the south and the Kagasakirtis in the north, and the final assembly of Pangaea. Subject matter here boils down to Terrain accretion, arc magmatism, post-collisional magmatism, and high pressure, low te high temperature, low pressure metamorphism, for the most part. And I use geochronology, geochemistry, thermobarometry, and metamorphic metrology um, in this project. The other project in the South Pamir, uh, in the Alpine Himalayan orogenic belt, is totally different. This is a Miocene investigation of nice dome exhumation within the India-Asia collision zone. And the subject matter for this project boils down to syncollisional extension and salient development. Analytical tools include geologic mapping, structural analysis, geochronology, and thermochronology. So let's just pose some broad tectonic questions here. So what I'm interested in is what are the observable tectonic symptoms of pre-collisional plate convergence, so Cordilleran or Andean style uh, orogenesis, syn-collisional plate convergence when continents have already collided and they're continuing to converge, like the India-Asia collision today, and then finally post-collisional convergence after convergence stops. Plates are no longer moving together, but uh, other tectonic processes follow. And then, uh, more broadly, are the Central Asian and Alpine Himalayan orogenic belts fundamentally similar or different from each other? So now I'm going to get into the Tian Shan. And uh, <coughs> the Tian Shan is the southernmost component of the Central Asian orogenic belt. It stretches 2,500 kilometers east to west from uh, China in the east through Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan in the west. It's divided into western and eastern parts by the right lateral to Las Fergana Fault and divided along strike by Paleozoic sutures that record this fragmentary enclosure of the Paleo-Asian Ocean within the scope of the Central Asian Orogenic Belt. And the final amalgamation during the Carboniferous to Permian uh, involves clo closure of the Turkestan or South Tian Shan Ocean Basin and the following collision between the Karakum Tarim and Kazakh Kyrgyz continental terrains. So here in this, I'm just cleaning this up a little bit so that I can point out the Talas Pergana Fault cross-cutting basically the entire Paleozoic architecture of the origin and uh, with the suture zones uh, extending all the way along strike. This is the Turkestan suture that we'll focus on for uh, this talk. Okay, here is a regional geologic map 
just showing, highlighting the age distribution of Paleozoic magmatic rocks. So bold colors show uh, plutonic uh, magmatic rocks, and uh, faded colors show uh, corresponding uh, volcanic igneous rocks. And what I want to draw your attention to is these uh, purples and blues uh, for Carboniferous and Permian magmatism. It's all over the place. It's in the western Tian Shan, in the south, in the middle Tian Shan, in the, in the eastern Tian Shan, way uh, to the east into China, um, from my perspective. And this just, what this signals is a first order uh, history of magmatism all over the place due to ocean closure at the final amalgamation of the, during the final amalgamation of the Central Asian Orogenic Belt. So that's the context of uh, the development of this part of the Tian Shan. And uh, now I'm zooming into the uh, western Tian Shan, west of the Talas Pagana Fault, which is uh, where my study is located. And <clears throat> here, so I want to point out a couple things. First of all, this is the Turkestan Suture, uh, which separates the middle Tian Shan and the south Tian Shan. And uh, there's also another uh, uh, suture zone down here, the Gisar Suture. Which, uh, and it's the interaction of these two suture zones that I investigated for, for this project. And what we see is there are two uh, arcs, uh, the Gisar arc and the Chakal Karama arc, which uh, both have a bunch of purples and blues on the map, which signifies uh, late carbon, late uh, Paleozoic arc magmatism um, coevally and across this suture zone for two separate arcs. So I think I'll move on. Uh, well, I guess it's worth pointing out that the Kazakh Kyrgyz terrain is the one in the north, and then the terrain that collided with it from the south is the Karakum terrain, terrain and they basically unified all along strike, along the strike of the Tian Shan to the east of the China uh, by the Turkestan Sutra. So that's the terrain boundary. Okay, and then this is where uh, my study was based um, within that part of the Tian Shan. And I just want to pose some regional tectonic questions specific to this uh, specific to this project. So how does the Paleozoic Gisar arc fit into the framework of the closing Paleo-Asian Ocean? How does the evolution of the Southwest Tian Shan compare with that along strike to the east and across the Talas for Fault? Locally, uh, upon what continental crust did the Gisar arc develop? And when and where, how deeply did the Gisar arc intrude? And then what broader geodynamic processes do the magmatic and metamorphic records reveal? This is my study area. This is a geologic map. and it. Um, Broadly speaking, there are two major lithotectonic units. The first is a series of uh, early to middle, middle Paleozoic active and passive margin volcano sedimentary sequences. The, in the north is a flish complex, and in the south is a subduction accretion complex, which is partly metamorphosed to green schist to blue schist facies, although the timing is very poorly constrained. And then uh, the other major uh, <coughs> lithotectonic unit in this part of the Tian Shan is the Gisar Arc, of course. So the Gisar Batholith is the western component, and the Gar Massif is the eastern component. And the Gisar Batholith basically comprises uh, granitoids, intermediate to felsic granitoids, and the Gar Massif comprises similar rocks, but with the addition of magmatites and uh, amphibolite to granulite bases, gneisses that are discontinuously exposed. It's really uh, chaotic, structurally speaking. And yeah, so this was amphi uh, metamorphosis to amphibolite to granulite facies, which is what I uh, focused my research on, rather than the region's facies event. So I'll point out where the suture zones are in this in the study region. The Turkestan suture is uh, cryptic, but it barely crops out in the northern part of the study area. And the Gisar suture zone is really well exposed and just butts up right against the Gisar batholit. Um, okay, so first question. So what, what did the Gisar arc develop on? What is this? What is the South Tian Shan within the framework of uh, supercontinent cycles and so on and so forth? This map here, don't bother reading all the text. It's just uh, designed to highlight the locations of uh, detrital samples that we dated by detrital zircon geochronology. So the samples include uh, modern river sand samples, Cretaceous sandstones, and uh, metasedimentary rocks at both the green schist facies and uh, amphibolite facies which I refer to as, as Paranysis more broadly. So um, here are the results. This is a probability density plot of all of the compiled uh, detrital zircon age spectrum. Time's going forward to the left. And uh, what we see, uh, long story short, is that there's this series of peaks from about uh, 1100 MA to about 
550 MA that reflect uh, the assembly and breakup of the Rodinia supercontinent. And they also characterize the southwest Tian Shan with, as a Peri Gondwanan crustal fragment. And these 600s in, in particular were uh, interpreted by, a research, by previous uh, workers who I agree with as a uh, to reflect the Tian, with the to reflect this terrain as a part of the Karakum Kraton rather than uh, the terrain across the uh, Turkestan Sutra Zone, which makes sense. Um, so anyway, when and where did the Gisar arc intrude? What depth and, and over what time frame? This map is just showing uh, <coughs> granitoid samples from my study and from a couple other previous studies, um, and you can see that they're distributed a lot more in the Gisar Batholith and also across the Garn Massif. So, firstly, we uh, dated the granitoids using igneous uh, uranium lead zircon geochronology. And here's a probability density plot showing the compiled results from my study and a couple other uh, recent studies. And uh, basically, there's three phases here. The early phase from about 323 to 306 MA reflects Andean style uh, convergence and magmatism. The second phase, which is apparently the highest flux, is uh, a cis original phase where continental crust is under thrusting and subducting uh, beneath uh, the Gisar microcontinent. And the third phase is post colonial magmatism. Uh, basically, everything after 290 or 288 MA. Um, I didn't mention this, but uh, post collisional uh, magmatic rocks outcrop across the Tian Shan at a regional scale, but they're much more dis uh, distributed and fragmented plutons just uh, all over the place as opposed to a linear, uh, you know, high volume batholith like the, like the Gazar batholith is. And they're also commonly uh, silica undersaturated, so there's a lot of alkaline rocks, cyanides, stuff like that. Okay, and then as far as the uh, crystallization pressure estimates, uh, this is a probability density plot showing the results from my study and, uh, and from a previous study for the, Gar the Gassar Batholith in this PDP and the Gar Massif in this PDP. And what we see is that overall the crystallization pressure estimates for the Gassar Batholith were on the order of 10 to 20 kilometers, whereas those for the Gar Massif were deeper uh, overall, around 20 to 35 kilometers. So that defines an eastward increase in paleo depth from the west to the east, which taken together with the timing um, and the, more of the geologic context is just our interpretation is that the Garn Massif represents the lower component of the Gisar arc, but it, so maybe the upper mash zone or the upper arc group. All right, so how about the tectonomagmatic evolution? What, uh, you know, was, were the Gisar arc magmas sourced more from the mantle, more from the crust, did this change over time, so on and so forth? We used zircon lutetium half moon geochemistry to address that question, and uh, on this plot, on the y-axis, is zircon epsilon half name value. More positive values are associated with juvenile or mantle-derived uh, magmatism, whereas more negative values are associated with more reworking of uh, continental crust and old and or evolved continental crust. <coughs> so this is all the data, but it's kind of a mess. So let's, why don't we clean it up a little bit by just plotting the granitoid samples from this study as averages, the ellipses show trends over time, if any. What we see is that early on uh, in the Andean phase, uh, it's, the magnetism is characterized by intermediate uh, epsilon half name values. Then there's an isotopic pull down during the sin collisional phase to more negative values. And that's followed by an isotopic pull up afterwards to narrowly constrained uh, and weakly positive epsilon half name values. But hey, that's just one study. Well, what did other people do? Well, yeah, this is more rocks from the same arc. And, these two other researchers got uh, more or less the same results. So it, this study in particular by Kastner really uh, fills in the gaps in this isotopic pull down. And there's, of course there's some noise, but so the igneous uh, data from two studies are corroborative. And then I'll add the detrital data from this study, which we have reason to believe uh, these samples uh, did source the Gassar art and not <coughs> some other part of the Earth. And they sample more broadly than their igneous counterparts, and also broadly corroborate trends in the igneous data. So we can see for this uh, dash list, which is a sandstone sample, it records uh, the isotopic pull down, and these two other samples record the isotopic pull up. And finally, there's also epsilon neodymium data, which is sort of the equivalent to half neum data. And it shows a positive correlation, which is what we'd expect. So um, 
now that we understand this chart a little better, let's uh, just walk through the story. So for the Andean style phase uh, from 323 to 306 MA, these intermediate values indicate equal magra, sub-equal magra derivation from the mantle and the crust. During the cyclogenal phase from 304 to 288, we uh, see that these negative epsilon half limb values indicate a stronger input from old and or evolved continental crust, so more continental crustal reworking, uh, consistent with a thickening or evolving arc, possibly from magma addition or retro arc thrusting, it's processes like those. And uh, finally, in the end, uh, from 288 to 272, um, these consistently positive half the values define an isotopic pull up, which indicates a rapid shift to juvenile, more mantle derived, and also silica undersaturated magmatism which is consistent with sub-arc lithospheric removal. Okay, on to the metamorphic history. Um, so we want to know, there are a lot of metamorphic rocks in this part of the Tian Shan, and we want to know what uh, you know, their investigation reveals about the broader geodynamic processes. So the tools we implement here are zircon and monazite uranium lead geochronology, thermobarometry, and uh, metamorphic petrology, real broadly. So this is the same uh, probability density plot that we saw before with uh, magmatism on the top and with the addition of uh, metamorphism on the bottom. The red uh, PDPs are, the red PDP is a composite of metamorphic zircon data and then this like dark gold PDP is uh, monazite data from granulite basis paradise. So uh, yeah, long story short, uh, well so here's a typical amphibolite basis paradise from the Garmisee that it's got a lot of amphibole. <laughs> um, with thermobarometry, we determined that the metamorphic conditions were upper granulite bases at moderate temperatures and spanned uh, on the order of 310 to 288 MA. So uh, on the bottom here, we see that this is coeval with the single collisional phase of the Gassar arc. And then uh, subsequent to that um, was a phase of granulite bases peak metamorphism. And this is a thin section image with a photomicrograph of a granulite facies paradise. It has uh, spinel and uh, solimonite, which are suggestive of those metamorphic conditions. But uh, most interestingly is this texture with this garnet. So what we have, well, first of all, let me just mention the timing. So we, the geochronology tells us that uh, the main metamorphic <coughs> episode was around 288 MA, so late in the history of the arc. And uh, this texture in this rock of uh, garnet resorption and replacement by cordierite indicates late decompression, which is important and also consistent with the rest of the story. So basically, this garnet grain boundary was at one time uh, a lot bigger, and then it was uh, it basically got resorbed and replaced by cordierite, which indicates coeval heating and decompression to peak metamorphic temperatures. So, uh, and this is a, uh, I'm not gonna go into detail with this figure. Um, said I did some thermodynamic modeling for this particular sample just to compare um, predicted uh, mineral stability fields and pressure and temperature space with our observations and uh, you just have to take my word for it that it's consistent and matches the thermobarometry pretty well but the, the reason I pulled this up is that uh, this is where I illustrate a clockwise pressure temperature time path involving prograde metamorphism to upper amphibolite facies conditions followed by uh, later peak metamorphism that also involved decompression to uh, granulite facies conditions um, at uh, lower pressures as low as six to four kilobars. So, all right, now I'm gonna walk through a series of time steps uh, documenting or uh, pontificating about the origin, birth, life, and demise of the Gassar arc. All right. Origin of the Gassar arc. So here's the first series of cross sections. South is on the, on the left and north is on the right. Around 350 to 330 MA, this is when uh, this uh, back arc rift began to form. And I think that it happened in the upper plate of this uh, subduction system where the Turkestan Ocean was subducting southward beneath the Karakum terrain and uh, subducting via slab rollback, which would throw the upper plate into extension and uh, facilitate the rifting. Next time slice, still, we're still in the origin phase, no, no arc magnetism has happened yet. From around 330 to 325, the Gassar back arc evolves into a full-on oceanic spreading. So now oceanic crust is being generated where there was no oceanic crust before. And also at that time, um, I think that the 
complete convergence was partitioned from this uh, subduction zone, where the Turkestan Ocean was subducting to the south, into a northward facing subduction zone beneath the Kazakh Kyrgyz terrain. Um, and I didn't mention it, but I also think that in, in this uh, time slice, the development of this Zarafshan subduction accretion complex and the blue schist facies metamorphic belt uh, may have also been related to that same southward subduction episode. Okay, now on to the, probably the more fun part of the, the story. So this is the birth of the Gassar arc from, it's pretty broad, from 323 to 304, perhaps more during the beginning, but this phase is characterized by Andean-style Gassar arc magnetism due to the northward subduction of the Gassar back arc ocean basin under the Gassar microcontinent, generating uh, the Andean Gassar arc uh, batholith, and which intruded this uh, subduction accretion complex. And coevally with that, there's also Andean-style magnetism in the Kurama arc uh, in the Kazakh Kyrgyz terrain due to northward subduction of the Turkestan ocean basin. So moving on to the life phase, broadly speaking, this is characterized by syncollisional magnetism, uh, coeval with underthrusting and subducting subduction of thin Karku Marshall continental crust beneath the Gisar microcontinent. And uh, this is when both the Gisar suture and the Turkestan suture formed because the continents were united together. And also, uh, this is the time frame of amphibolite phases, <coughs> contact on Barovian metamorphism and pigmentization. Moving on, the demise of the Gisar arc, I think this is actually the coolest part. This is uh, the end of plate convergence. That these two continental terrains are no longer getting any closer to each other. That's stopped. So delamination, well, I should probably back up a little bit and mention that during this phase, uh, I think there was a developing uh, crustal root, which eventually may have become gravitationally unstable, and by this phase, uh, foundered due to its gravitational instability, and basically sank into the mantle and uh, induced a stenospheric upwelling um, as a result. That's consistent with the uh, onset of post-collisional magnetism with really juvenile uh, petrotectonic characteristics, as well as the granulite basis peak temperature metamorphism due to the late decompression to higher temperatures. So that's, in my mind, that's what's most consistent with uh, all the data. So, okay, I'm gonna just run through this really quickly. So we know that Tian Shan was a perigon uh terrain that the southwestern Tian Shan was uh, <coughs> The Perigon Duan and Crustal Fragment, um, and the Karakun terrain is what hosted the development of the Gassar arc. And you know, I'm not going to bother going through these two, uh, these two uh, bullet points because I just talked about them in the previous slide. All right, so now we're going to fast forward about 250 million years from the late Paleozoic to the middle, middle Cenozoic. Don't go too fast. <laughs> the, uh, so now we're looking at the Alpine Himalayan orogenic belt, specifically in the Pamir. Uh, and this study is all about nice domes, so let me define them, first of all. Nice domes are dome-shaped culminations of higher-grade metamorphic and igneous rocks mantled by lower-grade or non-metamorphosed uh, rocks in general. The Pamir and Tibet systems uh, expose a really diverse uh, suite of nice domes with the maximal abundance in the Pamir. And uh, because there's so many of them, they, there's a variable, quite a variable timing and uh, diversity of mechanisms of burial and exhumation of these domes, which provide an opportunity to investigate syncollisional lithospheric dynamics. The exhumation mechanisms for nice domes boil down uh, primarily to exhumation on, uh, via extensional shear zones and exhumation via contractional shear zones, with important influences by climate-enhanced erosion, diapurism, and rheology that I won't address in this talk, but I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. So here's just cleaning up this image a little bit. Um, you see that Pamir Dystome system up here is uh, parallel to the curvature of the Pamir salient. And all these uh, nice domes in the Himalayan, um, in the northern, southern Tibet, northern Himalayan nice domes, and those along strike uh, parallel the curvature of this part of the origin. And then we have the two syntaxes right here. Um, so I'm not going to get into detail about how those evolve. It's interesting, but there's just not time. So I'll note that in the Pamir, there's this uh, geophysicist that uh, imaged um, a subducting or delaminating slab of Asian lithosphere and continental crust below uh, Indian continental crust, or Gondwana <coughs> crust more broadly. 
and different ideas, a lot, a lot of ideas about what this re represents, whether it's an Asian slab or an Indian slab. I've gone back and forth myself. I, the community has as well. But the current model is that uh, this is forced delamination um, of the Asian slab by uh, underthrusting Indian mantle lithosphere, and which I view is pretty different from subduction because it involves different driving forces. So I'll return to that later. Um, so okay, let's, extensional mesomes are the focus of, of my talk. So yeah, they typically form in zones of regional extension. Makes sense. Uh, classic example is uh, Cordier and metamorphic core complexes. Um, and the exhumation of these is driven by a plate boundary uh, scale change from contraction to extension. Makes sense, pretty simple. And a slab rollback setting, that's another tectonic setting uh, that nice domes have been documented to be exhumed via extensional kinematics. So this is a, this is a um, cartoon of the Aegean Sea where uh, we have an extending salient in the upper plate above a retreating or rolling back lower plate. And, and these, these nice domes have basically they call it uh, crustal scale boudinage. Um, and uh, they, I, the predicted younging direction uh, should be to in the direction of slab retreat. Um, but note that this is uniformly lithospheric scale extension. And that's what's ex driving the uh, exhumation of these extensional nice domes. Hey, so let's look at the Palmyra. That's a salient too. I mean, that's uh, pretty suggestive. And we just looked at that image with the uh, subducting or delaminating Asian lithosphere below it. Um, this suggests, uh, strongly suggestive of oceanic style rollback and driving extension in the upper plate. And we would predict, uh, based on this model, that the nice dome exhumation would occur more earlier in the south where rollback started and uh, later in the north where uh, rollback propagated to. So uh, a lot of people have caught on to this. Uh, this is a paper by Ed Sobel from a few years ago. And I don't think he was as interested in the nice domes, but he definitely caught on to the pronounced curvature of the Pamir orcline and the slab underlying it. And it's really natural to link those things together. Um, so that's, that was his model. And then we, we uh, we also got onto this a few years ago. This is a we, this is a figure from an NSF proposal, um, and we proposed two end-member models. Uh, one was a rollback-driven extension of the nice domes, and the other end-member hypothesis was uh, extension of the nice domes related to underthrusting of the Indian continent. And the title of this grant grant proposal, which was, uh, did the pioneer nice domes at Salient form by northward underthrusting of India or southward subduction and rollback of Asia? Drink water. Anybody have any questions? I think I'm doing okay on time. Okay, let's move on. So this is, uh, this is a map of the Pamir salient and nice dome system on a topographic base. And I just want to draw your attention to the the nice domes, which are outlined in red, um, these are the central Pamir nice domes, and here's the south Pamir uh, composite nice dome. And then there's also uh, there's uh, sort of linked nice domes in the east Chinese Pamir, and they're all bounded by central structures. That's been documented within the last uh, few years pretty thoroughly, um, and they uh, these uh, nice domes in the north have, are, were exhumed mostly by uh, the northern shear zone, so exhumed and extruded uh, southward um, with the you know, relatively uh, minor shear zones in the south accommodating less of the exhumation. But they're fairly symmetric and they parallel the curvature of the auric line very neatly. Whereas in the south Pamir, there's this asymmetry that uh, totally contrasts with, the, with what's going on in the central Pamir. The South Pamir is the Shakdara Dome, which was exhumed from way deeper. I'll show you the depth estimates in a minute. But uh, by two uh, oppositely merging shear zones. So here's the South Pamir shear zone, which is atop to the south, normal sense myelinitic shear zone that exhumed the footwall or the Shakdara Dome to the north. 
And in the east, the Alcher shear zone, which is a top to the north uh, myelinic shear zone, exude the Alcher dome to the south. So there's this asymmetry, not only in uh, extension directions, but also in uh, depth of uh, the exposed the exposed crustal depths and um, well, that's the main thing. <laughs> so now I'll mention exhumation depths. For the central Palmyra, it's pretty consistent. There's 25 to 35 uh, kilometer, uh, kilometers of exhumation via north-south extension. And in the south Palmyra, in the, in the Shakdara Dome, it should actually be 35 to, between 35 and 55 kilometers of exhumation. It's a pretty big dome, so there's a very wide range of uh, exposed crustal levels that were exhumed by the same structure. And then for the Alger Dome, uh, there are no current thermobarometric barometric estimates, but 10 to 20 kilometers is actually a reasonable guess uh, based on the rocks that are exposed here. Um, and here's where I'm going to drive and the, where I'm going to go to in the next image. Oh yeah, but let me just uh, mention that the East Pamir was exhumed largely by east-west extension that cross-cut the Miocene north-south extension of the Pamir Nice Domes. So that's a later exhumational event. And there's some complexity in here with the Mustagada Nice Dome, which is a little bit of both. So here is a topographic map of the South Pamir, so the, Al the Shakdara Alachur Nice Dome Complex. <laughs> um, this is the Shakdara Dome in the west and the Alachur Dome in the east, and they're separated by this low strain graben, which uh, underwent relatively little deformation and uh, is also cooled very slowly. Um, so let me just reiterate that the, this is the South Pamir Shear Zone, which uh, bounds the Shakdara Dome to the south and exhumed it to the north-northwest from about 30 to 55 kilometers at between one and three kilometers per million years. That's a bulk estimate, and it, the, uh, it includes a lot of, the lower exhumation rates probably reflect uh, exhumation in this part of the dome, which I'll address more later. And then for the Alger Dome, so we know the reconnaissance work from previous studies uh, showed that the Alger Shear Zone bounds this dome to the north and exhumed it to the south um, from more or less 10 to 20 kilometers. But we want to know uh, when that was and how it relates to the Shakdara Dome um, so that we can put together a more coherent picture of exhumation in the south come here. And then for the Turantai uh, Graben, this was slowly exhumed at about 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 kilometers per million. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, show a couple field photos from the South Pamir Shear Zone just to highlight this. It's asymmetry. So this uh, field photo from the Central Pamir, or sorry, from the uh, Central uh, South Pamir Shear Zone corresponds to this image right here. And here we see. Well, let me back up. So in this in this photo, we're looking off to the southwest at the rest of the South Pamir Shear Zone, and then here's the basin. That's Afghanistan in the background. And the foliation is really well developed. You can totally see it from a distance. And uh, the, there's also even SC fabrics that you can see in here that I haven't highlighted. But this is a zone of very high temperature uh, shear zone uh, development. Whereas compared to the uh, eastern extent of the shear zone, where it sort of tips out and uh, accommodates less and less terrain, the foliation is much more poorly developed. It's a lot harder to see. And uh, overall, just didn't exhume rocks as much as the shear zone did uh, to the west. So looking at it, uh, this is an outcrop photo of the high temperature part of the shear zone, uh, just showing ductile Cape Feldspar and quartz. There's a lot of other petrologic data that tells us a lot of other things about the temperatures of deformation, but just to a first order, the ductility of Cape Feldspar indicates high deformation temperatures, perhaps on the order of six, 700 degrees Celsius. And then in this part of the South Pamir shear zone, uh, this is what, when you go here and try and measure foliations and lineations and so on and so forth, it's, this is what you get. It's very, the foliation is very poorly developed, and feldspar is not ductile at all, and the quartz is minimally ductile, and strain very little. So, um, yeah, now I'm going to go to the Alatra Dome and describe that in more detail. So, okay, here's a geologic map of the Alatra Dome. Um, Again, this is the Alatur shear zone, which is a top to the north, myelinitic, uh, normal sense shear zone. All these lineations are pointing off to the north-northwest. Um, and in the hanging wall, we have uh, mainly Permian to Triassic strata, which are intruded by Jurassic to Cretaceous continental arc granitoids. So all these reds here. And then in the foot wall, there are 
The same Jurassic to Carnaceous continental arc granitoids, which I've labeled as the salmon color, I'll tell you why in a second, but also the presence of, uh, of migmatites, Cretaceous migmatites in this part of the dome. And uh, the reason I labeled this uh, with a salmon color is because it's, the football is just pervasively intruded by this early Miocene leucogranite injection complex, which I'll, hopefully I convince you later is uh, synkinematic with respect to the Alter shear zone. So here it, here's the dome and cross section with north on the right, south on the left, and we see this simple just geology of a batholith uh, in the hanging wall and uh, the intruded strata. And then in the foot wall, this uh, same rocks, but with a ton of leucogranites just pervasively injected everywhere. And they get caught up in the shear zone um, where they get those uh, crustal levels, which I'll show you some pictures of in a minute. So, yeah, now here's a view of the Alatir shear zone looking off to the east, and uh, it bends uh, due to a corrugation syncline. Um, and you can see from this distance how well developed the foliation is. The Alatir shear zone compared to the South Pamir shear zone was deformed under lower temperatures, but still a significant amount of strain. Looking at it more closely, here's an outcrop photo of uh, myelinitized leucogranite, um, myelinitized myosine leucogranite, and this is basically my textural field evidence for uh, synkinematic exhumation of this, a synkinematic injection of leucogranites in the Altra Dome. And now I'm just going to show a couple other photos of, uh, of the leucogranites. Uh, as you go further into the core of the dome from the detachment into the south, um, these leucogranite bodies are just more and more chaotically oriented. Here are some uh, Cretaceous megmatites in the core that are discordantly cross-cut by Miocene leucogranites. We know this from zircon uranium lead data. And then another part of the core, uh, we see this cliff face, which all, all this white stuff is Miocene leucogranite. And these uh, little blobs that I've outlined are the host rocks, the Jurassic to Cretaceous arc rocks. So you can see that it's just this huge volume of magma just Enveloping the host rocks in the in the core. Do you think it's in place, or is it from below? From below. I'll get to that. Um, and then this is a another view of the injection complex, uh, just a deck swarm. All right. When was the Alatir dome exhumed? Well, to figure this out, we used both geochronology and thermal chronology. So we dated Luca Granite injection to bracket the onset of exhumation. Um, because I determined that they were in place synkinematically. So we use a zircon uranium lead geochronometer, and I think it represents around 675 degrees Celsius crystallization temperatures. And then we also use thermal chronology to date the cooling of the dome through about 410 to 130 degrees Celsius. We use the argon mica chronometer for white mica and for biotite, and the zircon uh, helium thermal chronometer, which dates cooling through about 200 degrees Celsius, and then the appetite fission track chronometer, which dates cooling through about 130. So here's a lot of data. I'm not going to get into much detail about it, but what I want to point out is that these are the crystallization and cooling ages for the Altridome, and these are the corresponding ages for the Turum Tai Graben and the hanging wall of the Altridome. So what we see here is that collectively the cooling and crystallization ages span 23 to 5 MA. That just tells us the cooling was fast overall and exhumation was fast. And in the hanging wall and in the grabin, it spans a much wider range which reflects slow cooling. So now we're going to look at a little more detail, in a little more detail, at the Shakhtara Alatur nice dome complex itself. So there's a bunch of, so this is again a probability density plot with time going forward to the left. All these different chronometers are uh, highlighted in different colors, but I'll, I'll point them out to you so don't worry about all the different systems or anything. The first thing I want to point out is that the leucogranites span uh, 23 to 16 MA, um, and that, is, that defines the timing of emplacement of this injection complex. And I bracketed, I used that to bracket the onset of exhumation due to the synkinematic uh, textures observed in the field. <clears throat> and uh, ex the uh, cooling ages span from the argon system to the fission track system span 16 to 5 MA, and they date cooling through 410 to 130 Celsius. And through time temperature regressions, we get uh, cooling rates of about 30 degrees Celsius with decent amount of scatter, but to first order, that's not a bad estimate. OK, let's compare that to the Shakhtar Dome. Uh, magmatism, the zircon uranium lead ages for 
leucogranites, and most importantly, migmatites in the dome span a wider age range, but it overlaps with the, that for the Alatur dome. The cooling ages, which are more diverse for Shakhtar, there's, there's other petrochronometers that have been applied to this dome. Overall, they date exhumation from 22 to 2 MA, um, exhumation and retrograde metamorphism, um, and cooling through the amphibole argon to the appetite fission track uh, chronometric systems. And the cooling rates are higher for the Alatra Dome, um, on the order of 60 degrees Celsius per million years. And this is the, the link that I want to make between the two domes. I think that these uh, ages of magmatization in the Shakdara Dome essentially represent the origin of this leucogranite injection complex for the Alatra Dome. Um, the age range is similar, and there are a lot of restitic magmatites in the Shakdara Dome that have basically lost all their felsic, uh, <clears throat> felsic uh, component. And it's, I think that, that those antitectic melts from the equivalent of the Shakdara Dome basically rose through buoyancy driven ascent and were replaced into the Alatru Dome. So, I don't think I'm going to get into this. This is a uh, we can come back to this, but I think it's too much uh, detail for the amount of time I have. Long story short, the most significant uh, spatial cooling age trend for the Alatru Dome is increasing cooling ages away from the detachment. So the y-axis shows uh, cooling ages, and the x-axis shows distance. So we see that for the argon mica systems, cooling ages increase systematically away from the detachment. And for appetite, it's a, it's a little noisier. And I'm just going to skip through this. We can come back to it later if uh, if you want to. And then, based on that, I estimated exhumation rates, uh, and that's also a lot of detail that I probably shouldn't get into. But long story short, I used the trends from the latter the uh, regressions of the cooling ages with distance from the detachment, and then I applied those to spatially widespread samples in the footwall of the Alatru Dome to correct for uh, lateral variations in cooling ages and isolate them from elevation-related changes. And it's a real mess. It's really tricky to deconvolve these things from each other. But long story short, I did this for <laughs> the available chronometers, and I fairly consistently landed on a one kilometer per million year estimation rate estimate. Estimation rate estimate. So returning to this figure, Basically, I've just added the time frame for exhumation of the Alatru Dome and uh, the cooling rate and exhumation rate that I estimated. And I'll also point out now that the Gunkshio Zone, uh, which bounds the northern uh, Shakhtara Dome, has a documented early history of top to the north displacement, uh, which is basically the same as that for the Alatru Shear Zone. And it's been strongly overprinted by dextral kinematics. We don't know when, it's, it's really hard to tell. but. This uh, early history from, that was ascertained from structural data suggests that these two shear zones may have been linked, and, and I, I think that's the case. So, okay, too much data. <laughs> this is the Pamir Nice Dome system, and these are spatial temporal cooling age trends for the entire Nice Dome system based on bedrock data alone. And uh, I'll do something in a second, but first of all, I want to uh, just point out that this is the central Pamir. This is the South Pamir, and then the East Pamir, or Chinese Pamir, is uh, in the top part of the diagram. So to cut out some of the mess in this figure, let's just compare the argon mica ages to each other for the domes. This is not a bad way to, to compare the domes because the, the ages are the most precise compared to the other uh, thermochronometers. And uh, there's also the greatest number of ages for all the domes. So it provides the greatest, uh, it's just a really good opportunity to compare cooling of all these domes through around uh, 400 to 300 degrees Celsius um, and just sort of assess what trends there are. So what we see is that for the central Pamir domes, they cooled through mica closure between 18 to 13 MA. And that the South Pamir domes cooled a little later. The Alatru dome cooled from 16 to 11, and Shakdara spanned a longer time frame from around 16 to 5. In the East Pamir, we see that the Buistagana dome cooling ages span around 11 to 6 MA, and the Kongershan dome might get cooling ages are 5 to 1 MA, which is very young and very interesting. Um, 
And now I'm going to put this on the, okay, there's all the, the mess. We're not going to talk about that today. So now I'm just going to put these uh, broad uh, cooling age trends on map. So what I'm going to show in uh, the upcoming boxes is the cooling age range for the argon system in MICA and the bulk cooling rate for the domes through the whole range of available chronometers. So in the central palm here, um, these ages span around 18 to 13 MA and were cooled, the domes were cooled around 50 degrees Celsius per kilometer. In the south palm here, uh, we saw that for Alisher, the mica closure, the dome cooled through mica closure between 16 to 11 MA at around 30 Celsius per, M per million years. And Shakdara cooled between 16 to 5 MA at about 60 degrees Celsius per million year. And in the east palm here, the Musagata cooling ages span 11 to 6 MA, and we have uh, overall 125 Celsius per million year cooling rates. Although this is tricky because there are two stages of exhumation for the Musagata dome, which I indicate with these extrapolating these structures along strike. Early north-south extension followed by east-west uh, extension. And in my mind, it's still ambiguous which, what these cooling ages represent. I don't know for certain whether they're related to north-south extension or to east-west extension. And then finally, for Kongershan, these really young cooling ages and really rapid cooling rates. Uh, this is the fastest exhuming part of the Pamir and the highest peak in the Pamir and uh, represents a more recent episode of east-west extension that overprinted all of the uh, origin parallel or north-south extension. Anyway, um, let's not worry about all the other structures, but I guess what I will point out is just this uh, system of north-south striking uh, normal faults that represent, or been taken to represent lateral extrusion of the Pamir and during its later stages, which is also the same uh, episode that exhumed these uh, Chinese Pamir domes via east-west extension. All right, <laughs> so back to our original question. Did the Pamir nice domes and salient form by northern underthrusting of India or southward subduction and rollback of Asia? How about rollback of India? What I'm going to show now is a geodynamic model proposing that southward rollback of the Indian slab drove nice tomb exhumation in the Pamir. So here are two time slices, and I'm going to zoom in on them uh, in a second. But they start in the Miocene and then end uh, you know, modern modern time. So let's drive to the go to the first one, and I'm going to walk through this step by step. So what we have is we have. Uh, Asia is in the north, again, this is north on the right, south on the left. Asia is outlined in blue with its mantle lithosphere down here, and uh, India is outlined in green. And what we're gonna focus on for now is 22 to 8 MA, the onset of slab rollback of the Indian slab, which is uh, illustrated by this dashed line of the Indian slab right here. So at this point, I think that the Pamir crust was uh, recently proposed to have thickened to about 90 kilometers, um, at least in the central Pamir. And at this point, this is when India starts rolling back to the south, leaving a partially bulldozed Asian mantle lithospheric wedge right here in its wake. We know that, uh, well, let's just move on from there. And at this point, when rollback starts, the Asian upper plate was thrown from compression with uh, principal stresses of sigma three vertical and sigma one north south into extension with sigma one vertical and sigma three north south. So that's the beginning only illustrated by uh, this part of the diagram. So now we'll move on to the, next, the second part of the diagram during the rollback phase, which is intermediate, and that's illustrated by this uh, dashed uh, slab here of India. And at this phase, the subducting Indian slab rolls back to the south with a 30 to 50 kilometer uh, hinge migration rate. I can tell you about that later, how I estimated it. And uh, southward propagation of north-south extension in the Asian upper plate. So this involves uh, principal stress orientations with a vertical sigma one, north-south sigma three, and east-west sigma two. And uh, this corresponds to rapid exhumation of the south Pamir domes via a loss in uh, gravitational potential energy. And let's not worry about these uh, xenolith rocks. And then finally, at the end of this uh, rollback, um, <clears throat> at the end of this uh, time cycle, Indian slab, the Indian slab stops rolling back uh, around the Karakoram is where I estimated, but continued slab pull puts the Indian, sl Indian slab hinge under tension. And this puts, uh, gives way to this onset of necking in the Indian slab, 
and also the cessation of uh, mesothelium exhumation in the central Pamir, but continued exhumation in the south Pamir. So now we're going to look at the later history. So this is another series of time slices starting from here with the Indian slab and it's uh, propagating north. This represents the end and this represents the beginning of this uh, phase that I'm going to discuss. So at the beginning here at around uh, 7 m 8 this is when the lower Indian slab breaks off um, <clears throat> after having necked quite a bit. And I think that it's reasonable to assume that there would have been a lot of stored elastic potential, elastic flexural potential energy in the Indian slab that would have been converted into kinetic energy when the slab uh, finally broke off. And at this point, the upper Indian slab also resumes uh, shallow northward underthrusting beneath Asia. So let's move to the next time slice, which is basically the intermediate to end of this uh, illustration. And this is just showing how the Indian slab underthrust northward under Asia at a rate of about 35 kilometers per million years based on geodetic rates. And it's bulldozing Asia and delaminating it at the lower middle crustal boundary illustrated uh, right here. And uh, this corresponds to the onset of westward lateral extrusion and east-west extension with principal stress orientations of uh, vertical sigma 1 and uh, north-south sigma 2 and east-west sigma 3 and also exhumation of the Congreshan Dome. So, okay, diagnosis. Uh, <clears throat> for the Pamir, the syncollisional the syncollisional nystone system was exhumed via north-south extension. For Alature, the time frame was as early as 23 and as late as 5 MA at about 30 Celsius, degrees Celsius per kilometer or one kilometer per million years. There was a southward propagation of north-south extension from the central Pamir to the south Pamir. And then later, that was cross-cut by east-west extension that exhumed the Kongreshan Dome. And that's related to resumed Indian thru under thrusting and lateral extrusion. And significant here is that there's high magnitude extension parallel to the plate convergence direction, which is very counterintuitive. And furthermore, if this model is correct, which I hope it is, that'd be nice, it indicates the development of a northward convex salient coevally with southward Indian slab rollback, which is exactly the opposite of what we've observed uh, in oceanic rollback systems. All right, wrapping it up here. Um, some broad remarks about the tectonics of <coughs> Central Asian and Alpine Himalayan or Jack belts. So the general symptoms are for Cordillera style plate convergence in both origins, we observe magmatic arcs with associated amphibolite facies, metamorphism, and pigmentization. Uh, during syncollisional convergence, the magmatism is more evolved, um, both for subduction magmatism as documented for the Tian Shan and anatectic melting as documented for the Pamir. There's a documented lithospheric removal for uh, both orogenic belts, uh, gravitational instability, rollback, delamination, etc. And uh, for the Pamir only, uh, high magnitude convergence parallel extension, plate convergence parallel extension. And then post collisional processes uh, only apply to the Central Asian orogenic belt. We observe low volume alkaline magnetism, um, possibly associated with crustal extension. Maybe I'll let uh, people ask me this question at the end of the talk, but I just want to zoom through some, some field photos real quick. So this is uh, Paul Cap in his natural state in the, in the palm here, looking at the, I think it's the Alger shear zone in the background. <clears throat> here are the, some of the people we worked with. We worked with great people from the Academy of Sciences. Um, they made a lot of things happen for us.